morning and welcome. Yep, to Hawley Baptist Church live um, on a Sunday morning or unless you're catching up um, on uh, YouTube or your podcast. So yeah. great to have you with us. My name's Neil. And I'm Jen. And um, this morning we start a new series. We do. We do. We do. And it's entitled The Seven Deadly Sins, which is... Um, well, the thing is, I feel like it's a checkbox for me. I'm like <laughs> looking at it and going, oh dear. Yes. Oh dear. Yes. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite an interesting title because I guess really... All sins are deadly, aren't they? And I, and I don't know where the seven deadly. Do you know where seven deadly sins came from? What well, they... uh, some monk? Oh, really? Some time back, um, decided that they were going to look at um, the what were the worst, or not like the worst, but the, the sins that would probably lead to your spiritual or physical death quickly. Oh, I know. Dun, dun, I feel like we need music. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. But it's, I feel like though, sin, I mean, I don't know if about the people who are watching, but sin's quite like, what is sin? Yeah. Like people don't use that terminology no. anymore. Yeah. And I suppose we, we'd maybe think about doing something wrong, doing like wrongdoings or what else, how else would you describe Ooh. sin now? Yeah, I don't, well, <laughs> I can remember as a child that I was told that sin was like missing the target. So oh. God's got this target and that target's perfection. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether you miss by a mile or you just miss the target. Got, you've missed full you've, stop. you've missed and therefore oh. um yeah and therefore actually deadly sins i think all sins are deadly actually if you stood behind the target yeah, would yeah. be <laughs> <laughs> or to one side of it so yeah so that's that's, that's, that's my understanding of it yeah, and, and we'll, see, we'll see we'll see we'll see what martin um says but uh yeah it's um it's missing god's perfect perfect target another thing i loved when i was a younger somebody once told me if you've got an exam and yeah. the pass mark is a hundred whether you get 99 oh, and that's so or, whether, when or, you do that. or whether you get one <laughs> you've still failed. you've still failed yeah and um and that, i think that's, that's quite comforting really because i think i'm nearer the one a lot of the time yeah. but um, actually the fail mark is just what everybody gets yeah, yeah. Get the, the hundred is perfection yeah. and if, if you're close to perfection no nah. um but if you're close to perfection oh, oh, just, me, <laughs> just me then um yeah, but yeah. Joking. So um, I think we got a, I think we got a video clip that uh, introduces the series. Let's, oh yeah, let's check, look at let's that. Let's watch that. Welcome, wherever you are. It's great to have you uh, with us. So we're doing a new sermon series, Seven Deadly Sins. And uh, yes, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Now, a little insight, I suppose, into my life. Um, do you, I don't know if you guys have particular hobbies. I like going round to people's and finding out what their hobbies are, what their interests are, particularly if they're things that I'm interested in. But I'm finding at my time of life, you know, I'm... I'm working, I've got children, I've got dogs and stuff like that. His life is too busy for, um, for hobbies. I used to have lots of hobbies. I just haven't got hobbies anymore. Anyone feel like that? They just haven't got time for the things that maybe they used to be interested in? Or maybe you've got a whole list of things that you would like to do, but you just haven't got the time. And you just have to find some interest where you can find them. And for me, the one thing I can do, which I do enjoy, and actually helps my family, is I like to cook. Good, yes. I like to cook, and I have an allotted time, because I'm very strict. We must eat at 6 o'clock. I've talked about this before. Must eat at 6 o'clock. And 5 till 6 o'clock is my time in the kitchen on my own. The kids are watching TV, and I can spend that hour getting the meal prepared, and I do recipes and all sorts. I suppose you could say that is my hobby at this time of life. And while I'm preparing my food, I like to flick on the radio. I listen to Radio 4, the PM show, from 5 till 6, which makes me very intellectual. And I'm all up to date with all the current affairs and what's going on in the politics and the world. But it, the downside of that is it makes me very depressed. Because what you hear is all the stuff that's going wrong. Be it with our government, be it with our country, be it with our world. It's just a list, an unlendless list of things 
that just don't seem to be right in the world. I know for some people, they switch it off. I know many people, I I used to live with a a great girl who who was one of my housemates, and her answer to this was, I just won't watch the news. Ignorance is bliss. As long as I don't listen to it, then it is not happening. But I think we all know and we are aware that things are not as they should be. Sometimes I listen to the news and I just think, I'm ashamed to be British. Sometimes I feel that I am condemned, even vilified, for maybe the things I think and the things that I believe. I'm really worried about my kids. Eldest is 11, then 9, and then 6. And what is the world going to be like for them? And, and I think we always go through this in history of ups and downs. You know, there's always difficulty, there's always wars, there's always struggles. But I do think that sometimes the environmental concerns that we're also facing as a world, where constantly we've been told about global warming and things like that, that just puts that added dimension of something we seem to have no control over. And we just wonder, with the war and the famine and the global warming, what is the future like? Where is the hope? What has gone wrong? And what can we do about it? You see, the Bible's pretty clear that the reason behind what we're facing, the reason behind the rubbish news that we have, this isn't working, is something called sin. Now, if we go on to the next slide. Sin. The word that we uh, use uh, in, um, in, in Hebrew is Guitar or something like that. It's not guitar or something. It's guitar. You can I did try and listen to it, but I can't remember what it is. And and I see. Just to give you an insight on what it means, I shouldn't have gone to this slide. I've given the game away already. But uh, when I was about 18 years old, I went on a family holiday to Cyprus, and uh, we went on this um, hotel thing, and they had lots of activities. And I remember one particular activity was archery. And there was an archery contest, and I had this bow. I'd never done archery before, and there was a target set up, and I found I was really good at it. And you know what? I won the archery contest, and the prize was a free cocktail at the hotel bar. And I was really chuffed, because not only was I going to get this free cocktail, but the very attractive holiday rep was going to take me and buy this cocktail. So we went to the bar... And she ordered a cocktail, went, see ya, and left me on my own in the bar to sip my cocktail all on my own. But I had this idea in my head that I was an archery expert. I'd shot that arrow, it had gone, boom, into the target. So when I went to the uni that year, well, I was in the Elvin Richards Hall. And we have lots of students live in lots of halls, and you have competitions between the different halls of residence. And they said, does anyone know how to do archery? Because we've got an archery contest coming up. I'm like, yeah. I know, I'm a bit of an expert, actually. I won a competition. So we went along, they got the the target set up. Admittedly, it was a windy day, (laughs) but I could not hit the target. No matter how I tried, it either fell short or it went off left, right, or uh, above. See, that Hebrew word, chatar, means to fail or to miss the goal. You're aiming for the target and you just can't hit it. That is what sin means. In the Bible, it refers to some slingshots with a stone. Boom. They had people that didn't fail to miss. They didn't sin. They were trained that they just hit it. Boom, boom, boom. To sin is to miss that target. Alternatively, it's when you use your sat-nav and you maybe you're in a rush to get somewhere and you enter it wrong. And you end up miles and miles away from your destination. Anyone ever done that? I did that on a very stressful trip to a holiday with a child that was being sick. And we realized three hours into the journey that we were further away from our destination than when we started. That is also sin. To fail to prepare for your journey so you don't get to your goal. That is sin in the Bible. And we're going to look at, in a moment, 
the first use of that word sin. And we're going to unpack a little bit about what it means for us uh, today as we start this series of seven deadly sins. But we're going to go right back the beginning of the Bible. We're not going to be looking at one particular passage this morning. We're just going to be looking at a few. So you can have a Bible and you can look, but the, what the scripture is going to appear on the screen and you're going to be flicking around anyway. But we're told at the beginning of our Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created. And we're told this story of how God created the heavens and the earth. Everything we see around us, we're told the story of how God created it. And God looked at his creation and said, it is Good. He was pleased with what he had created. Then he came to creating us, humanity. This is what it says in Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. See, what does that mean? Does it mean that we look like God? That God had far, ten, how many, ten fingers and everything that's not really what it means. It goes on to kind of explain what it means. It says, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. See, the image of God meant that we would have the authority to cultivate, to shape to move, to, it's a bit like gardening really. I don't know if any of you are into gardening, we're kind of entering into gardening now. Maybe you've got a vision, a picture of what you want your garden to look like. I look at mine now, I think it looks atrocious, but I have a picture of what it could look like. Maybe you've got some ideas and plans. That's what it means to rule and to have authority, to be in the image of God. And God wanted humanity to rule over creation to make it something good. But there was a... Pro- Sorry, I'm just trying to work out my notes. But <laughs> humanity had a choice. They could rule that authority in that image of God by following God's choice, God's idea of what's good and evil, God's purposes, or they could choose to go their own way and do it make up their own mind about how they would do things. And in the Genesis accounts, that's symbolized through a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But, You must must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Are you going to do it my way, or are you going to do it your way? Are you going to trust me that I know what's good, and I know what's right, and follow that, or are you going to do it your own way? Well, if you know the story, you know that humanity, Adam and Eve, decided that they would do it their own way, helped along by a talking serpent. And the court's talking serpent who basically says, God is a liar. God doesn't want what's best for you. He wants to keep you down. You could be so much better than what you are. You've got so much potential. God doesn't want you to be like him. He wants you to just be slaves. And he tempts Adam and Eve to make a choice, the choice whether to the choice to go against God, and that's exactly what happens. And what we find is that because of that, we um, Adam and Eve are they're, they're separated from God. They're separate. There's, there's separation between the two of them. Straight away, they start fighting. God says to Adam, "Why, why, why did you eat the, from the tree I told you not to do?" And what does Adam say? It was her. She did it. The woman. She's the one that caused this problem. Straight away, there's separation between ma- humanity and God, humanity themselves, and also between their environment. Suddenly, this creation, creative um, job they're being given becomes hard work, and they're banished from the Garden of Eden. 
but they don't die. We'll come to that in a moment. Adam and Eve still live, but there's that separation. And they have children, they have two, two, two boys, Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel, they grow up, and Cain is into um, gardening. He likes doing lots of things with flowers and plants and things like that. Uh, Abel is more into his sheep, and they bring offerings to God. And Abel brings a lamb, a firstborn lamb, and um, Cain brings some, I don't know, bananas. I I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, But some agricultural stuff. And I don't know why I've looked at this. I looked for a reason. I can't find a reason. No one's got a reason because it doesn't say in the Bible. But for some reason, Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God. Cain's wasn't. And that causes some major issues. And Cain gets really, really cross and really, really jealous of his brother Abel. And it says this in Genesis chapter 4. This is God talking to Cain. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So Cain's done something wrong. We don't really know what that is. But God's saying, look, you've, you've done wrong, but it's okay. If you do the right thing... You'll be accepted. It'll be okay. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain is once again faced with a choice. Are you going to do what's right and follow God, or are you going to do what's wrong and go your own way? And if you know the story, Cain goes and kills his brother Abel, the first murder in humanity. Now, what's really interesting here, and what's key to note, is what sin is doing here. Because sin is not some sort of passive thing sitting there that we kind of stumble into. We accidentally do something wrong. What we have here is sin is being is an entity. I mean, they've personified it in the in the sense of a serpent earlier on in the story that is seeking you out. It's predatory. It's hunting you. It wants to destroy you. It wants to rob you. It wants to cause you to go down wrong routes in your life. In fact, in the New Testament, Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, picks this up in his letter in one Peter. He says, "Be alert." And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So rather than sin being a serpent, now it's got this entity, this being called the devil or Satan, who's trying to mess everything up for you, for humanity, for your community you're in, for society. Sin is a disease that is seeking you out. Now we like to maybe not think of that. We we think maybe if I just keep my head down and I just do what I need to do and I just try and be as good as I possibly can, that I'll just get by with life. But the Bible is quite clear that actually it's like standing in the middle of a battle where there's war going all around you and there's a battle and there's things going on. You just think... Maybe if I just sit down and be really, really quiet, then no one will notice I'm here. And the Bible says, no, you're in a battle, and you will be attacked. That's what sin does. So be alert. Be a sober mind. Keep your guard up. In A.D. 590, Pope Gregory I worked with some lists that had been compiled before, but he came up with seven, what he called seven deadly sins. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Sloth. Okay, laziness. Um... And he saw these as deadly, not because they would lead necessarily to our physical death, but they would lead to a 
spiritual death. And that's what God was talking about when he warned Adam and Eve that if you make this choice to go against me and do things your own way, it's going to lead to death. Not a physical death, but a spiritual death. And I looked up, you know, what does spiritual death mean? How has that come about? And it's quite clear that spiritual death is a separation between us and God. That's what spiritual death means. It forms a rift. It forms a separation between the creation and the creator. Between us and the God who loves us. Not only that, it it forms a separation between us and people around us. It forms a separation between us and the creation that we were called to look after, to manage, to help grow and flourish. It causes separation. And we're left with a thought. What do we do about it? See, the one thing I like about this list is it doesn't leave any of us out. See, the Bible makes it clear. If you claim to be without sin then you're a liar. You're lying to others, you're lying to God, and you're lying to yourself. All of us have sinned and fallen short of what God expects of us. We have failed to hit that target. We have failed to live up to the image of God that we are created in. And too often, we can use a list like that, and we can pick just one or two things, and we can use that as a a benchmark, and we can focus on that to attack others and go, oh, you fail in envy, or whatever it is. Look how bad you are. Look how sinful you are. Forgetting to look at the sin that we are also living in. We're looking at all seven sins because there will be no one here who isn't affected by one of those, or more. Possibly all seven. But the great thing is, the amazing thing is, is that we can do something about it. We can start to heal that, bring ourselves closer to God. That separation needn't be there anymore. And we're going to be looking at each of those over the next seven weeks and thinking, how can we sort this out in our lives? And I think there's three possible approaches. This is I come into to finish now. Three possible approaches, three things we can do when faced with these sins and faced with this separation between us and God. The first thing we can do is come up with a list of do's and don'ts, a list of rules and regulations, a moral code that will help us to be as good as we possibly can. I know that when I was growing up, that was kind of the, the, the Christianity that I was taught. And I remember very, I mean, I liked sort of uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, this idea of a moral code, a knightly code, you know, things that you should do. And I kind of had this idea in my head, these are the do's and these are the don'ts. And by the time I was at university, I had pretty much broken every single one. See, the Bible in the New Testament is very, very clear that rules don't work. Not when it comes to healing that separation between man and God. They can be helpful. They can be a real good guide to helping us live out the best life that we possibly can. But on their own, they are not enough to combat that predatory sin that wants to see us mess up in our lives. We can try as hard as we can, but we are never going to be good enough for God. We're always going to fall short and miss that target. So what was the response? Well, Paul, who wrote loads of really important letters to the early church in the New Testament, said, because of Jesus, these rules, they don't, you don't have to follow them. You are saved not by following rules. You are saved because Jesus died for you. Jesus has healed that rift. He has brought us 
humanity and God together. We are able to have an eternal relationship with God, not because of anything we have done, not because of the rules that we have followed, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. He became sin for us so that we might be freed from the sin in our life and the consequences, which is death. Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic priest who shook the church up, a revolution, we call it the Reformation, 500 years ago, looked at the teaching of the Roman Catholic church, which was very much, this is where this comes from, very much moralistic, do's and don'ts, and said, you don't need that. We are saved by faith alone. In fact, he said these words, sin boldly. Sin boldly. Because we are freed not by what we do, but because of what Jesus has done. For us. So that's one way. Okay, we, we look, look at moral codes, but James, brother of Jesus, looked at the teaching of Paul and he wrote just one letter. He went, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's be careful here because you can't just go around sinning and doing whatever you want. You can't go, well, hey, I've got my golden ticket. I'm saved. I can go to heaven. I can do whatever I want. He says, no. If you have claimed to have faith, but your actions don't back that up, then your faith is worthless. Your faith is dead. If you're going around and there seems to be no difference between you who claim to be a follower of Jesus and saved by Jesus' death on the cross and doing just everything you want, then that's not going to work. It's a bit like a good tree. A good tree... Good fruit doesn't come from a good tree. A good tree produces good fruit. It's that way round. If we start to be a good person and we start to become more like Jesus, we start to see these good things come in our lives. But if we focus on the moral code, we have things round the other way. We're struggling to bear good fruit when we haven't solved the problem of whether or not we're a good or bad tree. See, I've I've been struggling to get my head round this all week. I was chatting to my wife. My wife is very helpful in this regard. She said, what do we do? We can't focus on a moral code, but if we don't do good and right, then our faith is dead. What what is the answer? And this can be really confusing about Christianity. You're saying that I have to be a good person, but I don't have to to follow all the rules because Jesus died for me. It's really complicated. And I just thought back to, we had baptisms last week. Three baptisms, it was great, David, Amir, and Josie. And it was great to see them declare their faith they had in Jesus through the waters of baptism. And every time I do a baptismal class, we talk about the word repentance. Because it comes up in the promises that they make. And repentance means, and this is what I actually get up and I act this out. I say, look, there's God over there. And when you're not a follower of Jesus, you're kind of living with your back towards God's. Maybe you're ignoring him. It just doesn't feature in your life. Maybe you're actively walking away from God in the opposite direction. Repent literally means to turn around and to go, you know what, I'm going to walk that way. I'm going to walk closer to God. I'm going to look at God. I'm going to find out what what does he want in my life? How does he want me to live my life? And that's the answer. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next seven weeks. It's not saying that none of these things are important. It's not saying you've just got to try really, really hard, although discipline is important. It's saying, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I want to be more like him. So therefore, I'm going to face God. I'm going to walk towards him step by step. Some days I may stumble and go backwards. Some days I may be looking at my feet or looking around distracted. But ultimately, ultimately, I want to move closer to God. And the great thing is that we, when we become a follower of Jesus, we receive God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to live inside us, to help us to become more like Jesus, to help us to be a good tree that bears good fruits. So really, as we start this series... And we're going to have some questions come up in a moment. Are you prepared to repent? Are you prepared to make changes in your life that involves you walking 
towards God. Being transformed by that journey. Knowing that we are not going to be perfect, but we can change. And those sins in our life that entangle us, that slow us down, that trip us up, that hunt us out, they need no longer have power over us because of Jesus. So we're going to listen to some questions. Uh, and then we're going to just take some time to respond in prayer and we're going to sing some songs. So here are the questions. Are there sins in your life that are entangling you? Do you feel as if you are drifting from God? Are you prepared to make changes in your life? Um, a really useful revisit I think in a foundation because obviously this is a series about the oh hopefully you can still hear me yeah. vision is coming <laughs> this, back vision is coming back hopefully this is um, a series about the seven deadly sins or the the ones that the monk came up with but the reality yeah. is actually if you don't know what sin is yeah that's kind of all immaterial to you, isn't it? Yeah, you don't yeah. know what's. <laughs> you uh, don't know what they're talking right. about. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the seven deadly sins. Let's not get caught out about, about it. it, it it's around sin, <laughs> and the, one of the things I really liked was um, Martin's definition. Hey, about missing the target, which I'd mentioned yes, earlier. I yes, like that. Yes. Um, but it's also it's it's separation. Sin yeah. separates us from God. So, I mean, if we looked at that first question um, that Martin yes. um, put up, it was. Um, uh, are there sins in your life that are entangling you? I mean, the answer is yes. Yes, <laughs> there probably is. Yes, and it <laughs> might be it might be different sins for different horses for courses and different sins for different people. Mm. But um, we all miss um, God's target. And yeah. uh, one of the things I found helpful was that, was that the, the result of that is that um, separation from God, but actually also separates us from like each Adam other and Eve were separated yeah yeah, arguing, yeah yeah and you know and, and if i'm jealous or envious of you and what you can do then mm -hmm. that, that very easily starts to cause a separation between yeah. uh, us as well yeah so and yeah. i think there is um sort of reflecting on it sometimes people go down i've heard people say this and i think there was an incident of martin brought it up in the sermon about paul saying well you know it's not by great it's by grace not by your works that yeah. you're set free yeah. from your sin which some people would go to that as almost to like a carte and blanche that they can sin. Yeah. And they don't need to make any effort. And it's, it's all right because I believe in Jesus and I'm forgiven. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's wrong. Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Of, do, do you yeah. know what it is? Yeah. I think there is, yeah. we have a part to play, is how I feel. Yeah. yeah. So, but I don't think we're ever, we're ever going to get it quite right, right until no. the end. No. Um, but I think it's about yeah. um, that, like, like the, the redemption thing, yeah. turning your back, yeah. um, you know, repentance. Well, yeah, redemption, yeah, repentance, yeah, interchangeable yeah. words. Repentance, but, yeah, 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 repentance. Yeah. So turning your back yeah. on those things and trying to move yeah. away from them, trying to move forward to Jesus rather than towards those. And, and I think it'd be really difficult because some wrongdoings are so subtle, aren't they? They're yeah, so yeah, difficult yeah, yeah. to pinpoint, um, and you can kind of just becomes like a habit of your yeah, life. And, and you justify it to yourself. Yeah, you and justify you just it. You just think it's only yeah, small. Yeah, yeah. Um, nobody's, or everybody, nobody, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Or nobody will know about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I was um, sort of just mentioning to Neil um, during the sermon that um, I, the thing that I get caught up in, which separates me more, 
I mean, the sin separates me, the wrongdoing separates me from, from God and from others can do. But for me, it's the on, the thing that I feel is used against me is the guilt and shame. Yeah. So I think yeah. sometimes people can find it really difficult to face, turn, you know, that whole vision of sort of turning away from what you're doing wrong and facing towards Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that can be sometimes very difficult if you're living with guilt and shame and sometimes you're sort of, you know, you're looking down or you, you find it hard to do that turn in because you know and i think sometimes that's used it's it's really truly it's really hard to well, truly accept that forgiveness yeah. and that sometimes. is satan just yeah. just just gnawing away you and yeah. putting that doubt in your mind yeah Let me put the third question up yeah. which was um are you prepared to make changes in your life when i saw this question yeah. my mind immediately turns to well i could stop doing that or i could try and do this or i could do mm. this more mm. and actually what martin is saying is absolutely right is the only change we really need to make is turn more towards Jesus yeah. and yeah. allow Jesus and Jesus' Holy Spirit change yeah. the way yeah. we act. I, I remember another little analogy from when I was a, um, a child, a young, a young Christian, was um, um, the minister used to talk about um, cart and horse. He said, yeah. so the, the, you, you, the horse is, is having faith. Yeah. He said, if you want to move stuff, you need a, a horse and a cart. Yeah. But if, so, and, and then the cart is like works, doing good things. Yeah. He said, if you've got just the horse, you've got faith, but you're not doing anything good. You're not going to move anything. You're not going to move anything. Yeah. That's, a, that's a waste. Yeah. And if you've yeah. got, if you're doing all these really good things, but you don't have Jesus, it's like you trying to move a car, which is impossible. Yeah. So you need the horse first. You need that faith. And as more we get to know Jesus, then we can hook up the car and we can start, yeah, no, start, that's... start to do good things. That's and I've told you that I was about, I don't know, about ten, I think. But see, well, <laughs> 50, still, still 50 affected, years later, it still yeah. reminds me because sometimes I think I'm trying to move that 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 car on the own often a lot of us, a lot <laughs> you know. of us are. and i think because we ha we do have intellect yeah we do have yeah, yeah. choices yeah. and um you know i'm in a profession i'm a nurse by by profession and, and we problem solvers we yeah. try to find yeah. solutions yeah. for things yeah. so and by ne very nature of what you're saying is all of yeah. those things in your car are trying to find solutions yeah. and yeah. do things yeah. for yeah. people or for yeah. yourself to make yeah. things better yeah but like you say without yeah. something to pull it along yeah the, yeah. the change we need to make in our life yeah. is um is this turn turn to jesus yeah. and that is if we start to do that more and more and more and allow god's holy spirit in us then all the other things we do wrong it's it suddenly become easier yeah rather than us trying to you know go on a self-help yeah. course to stop doing you know yeah. and i think and i think the other thing is about that being really a a real head and heart choice as well mm. isn't it because you know the head can say yes I, I believe in jesus i follow jesus but yeah. you know it is like a, a sink into the heart the acceptance of the holy spirit to help you because then your desire because it's a it's a relationship isn't it it's a friendship it's a you know somebody you will look, come to love in jesus you don't want to do wrong things that's going yeah. to upset them yeah. you know it's no, like, absolutely you know, so, absolutely so yeah start of the series uh it's number one there's yes. uh, there are funny enough seven more to come we're, <laughs> we are actually going to start looking at some of those what are entitled deadly sins but um um so stay with us uh it's i think it's gonna be a really good um series today was the introduction to it yeah. um yeah so um if, you want, if you've got questions that you know um you disagree with what we're saying or you, you or you're not sure not really. then yeah i've gone and uh, <laughs> got questions at hollybaptist.org.uk please do email us and um, someone um, we'll come back to you or if you've liked what you've heard you think it's gonna be a good series and please feel free to share it um with friends um we'd love to um uh, share the good news of jesus um, um yeah as well great